Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming. We're excited to present our work. Um, to start, we'd like to talk about what we think is a really important resource uh, for all of us and for New York, and uh, particularly for young architects, and that's the Architectural League, uh, who we give our thanks to, um, and in particular to Anne Rieselbach and Nick Anderson. We'll also start by thanking uh, friends who helped us uh, with our portion of the show next door, Caitlin Abruzzo, George Macalani, Alex Parsons, and Matthew Hasseltine. So in thinking about resource, um, I recalled a story uh, from college that I overheard a fellow student have a desk crit, and she began by saying, my idea is, and she explained her idea, and the professor said to her, no, that's not your idea. Uh, there are no new ideas. And it's probably an oversimplification, but it's something that, that we've come back to in our work and in our discussions, because certainly as architects, we have a heavy weight, a, a rich resource of ideas and uh, theories and uh, built objects and buildings and places that really give us so much to learn from. Um, in addition to that, there's the unconsidered detail, the vernacular, the sort of DIY moment that we find interesting as well. So our work tonight uh, will look at some old ideas and some new ideas and the sort of strange intersections that we find between those. Okay, so um, the first project we'll talk about tonight is um, an RFP that we answered a few years ago. Um, it was put out by a kind of a weird semi-hippie artist um, uh, communal farm in upstate New York, which you can see here. And uh, basically, they, they, they grow uh, crops and they sell them to sustain their artistic endeavors. So um, the RFP asked for three, um, maybe I should raise this a bit. Um, it asked for three uh, live work studios that the, art, the artists could um, uh, do their artwork in. and. Um, they had three criteria, which I'll forget if I don't read it. Um, they wanted them to be easily constructed by unskilled labor on site. Um, they wanted them to be extremely affordable. And uh, most importantly, that they be mobile. So um, here are these typical um, produce stands that they, they wheel around the site. Um, and our initial idea for making mobile architecture was to, to put wheels on it and just wheel it about the site much like you would um, uh, a trailer. Um, but we felt that didn't really address the, the site, and it was a little too impermanent, and uh, wheels are probably not the like, softest way to touch the earth. So um, we've always been really interested in uh, nomadic architecture. So here you can see a, a, a Bedouin tent, which is quite simply um, a fabric, which is tensioned over a frame below, or the Native American teepee, which is, is a similar concept, but instead it has a tripod, um, and our favorite, the yurt which is a um, pretty interesting structure when you get inside of it. Um, it's a, let's see, how, let's see, okay. So can, can you see the, the little hand? Okay, so it's pretty interesting. You can, um, this is like a completely clear span inside and it has a pretty, uh, there's no columns and uh, it has this really interesting uh, crisscross framing of bamboo at the perimeter which um, is tied at these intersections and then um, the, uh, the roof structure is kind of formed from these um, steam bent plywood pieces that go up to this compression ring here. And we were thinking this would be a pretty amazing space for an artist to do to uh, work in because it's completely open inside and uh, free plan. They could arrange it in any way they wanted. Um, but because they're like farmers and they uh, artists and they may not be construction savvy, we were, how could we make this thing kind of foolproof for them to build? So we decided that probably it should be panelized in some way. Um, so taking the crisscross framing with the tied connections, but um, thinking of it in, in terms of pieces that could then be joined to other pieces. And um, let's see, here's the next slide. So if you, if you take a simple yurt here, which has, has a round plan and a dome, and you um, kind of project onto that a geodetic sphere, which is formed from these faceted panels, and, and you begin to um, reduce the subdivisions until you get to something here called the icosahedron, which is a uh, 20 sided figure. Um, this was kind of like the ideal for us, which um, when you scale a person, these panels, uh, you could imagine two people putting them in place, but uh, you know, still um, enough 
enough, uh, too few facets that it's not overly complicated. Um, of course, we needed a floor, so we um, bisected it into a 13-sided figure, which I, I don't know what it's called. Um, and then we uh, just began uh, moving the points around um, to accommodate program to uh, more or less final configuration. So if I went to the next slide, this is kind of the overlay of our new geometrical panelized um, yurt kind of frame with the bamboo crisscross um, tied connections. And we thought this was pretty interesting when you consider the fact that this is like a new form for the yurt, but it uh, still relies on these traditional lashing techniques, which have been around for thousands of years. So um, the interesting uh, kind of side effect, getting away from uh, a round plan of the yurt, and now this kind of hexagonal form, is that it um, nests nicely with um, other, other mates. So um, here you can imagine um, the, the call was for three units. We can imagine you know, if, if these people are working on a project, they could all, all be grouped together working communally. Um, if they didn't get along or they wanted to do independent work, you know, these things could separate. So um, the next slide here is um, the kind of um, simplified version. You know, getting away from this, this is not um, easily producible. It's not customizable. So our kind of mass-produced um, uh, final form um, was this, and they left the RFP open. If, if it was a successful project, they would, they would build many of these things if they got more funds. So um, we kind of envisioned that you know, these things could group up over the site, um, you know, larger <coughs> configurations. Um, you know, this is a group of friends or people working on a project. Um, this is the solitary guy who wants to work alone, and um, in the winter they could begin to huddle to share resources or create larger um, spaces, because uh, some of the walls you can remove to create a larger um, structure. So, um, so, so we had a, a plan strategy, but we didn't necessarily, and, and a structural idea, but we didn't necessarily have a, a skin for this. So um, a lot of them are vegans on the site, so we didn't want to um, suggest doing it in like animal skins like you would a teepee. So we, um, we looked at North Face tents, which um, there's all sorts of manufacturers for high-performance tents, but uh, they all pretty much use ripstop fabric, which is, um, you know, it doesn't rip, as, as the name suggests. Um, it's, it's really great at protecting from the wind and the rain, but um, it's not exactly great for insulation. And the insulation, then, in this thing comes from a sleeping bag in, in cold weather. And um, because we wanted this thing to be used um, 12 months out of the year, we um, kind of envisioned that the sleeping bag could now be put on top of the, the frame of the yurt. So it's a quilted structure which ties in at the same points of the um, bamboo frame below. And here you can see um, what, what, what do we actually stuff this thing with? How do we insulate it? So we like the idea of um, kind of like something of the farm but something outside of the farm. So this is the high-tech ripstop fabric and then you know, you would collect this straw on site and stuff it within these vacuoles of the, the quilted uh, skin. Um, we get quite, it's, it's quite thick because um, hay is actually not that, or straw I should say, is not that great of an insulator. Um, so here you can see it tied into the, the bamboo frame. Um, and here in the summertime you can remove some panels, you can unzip them, it has mosquito netting. Um, here's an artist. Um, <laughs> And this is, um, so, so we were like, how do we exactly uh, program this, this, uh, this uh, hexagonal plan? So we looked at the teepee and the yurt, which though in elevation look completely different, in plan have a, a very similar um, characteristics. They, they force all of the program to the perimeter, and the interior is kind of left empty for um, ceremonial things. So here you have a fire, and it looks like an altar, similar thing here. So um, this is kind of our... Our, our take on it, we, we did not put um, an altar in the middle, but this is kind of an altar to art. So you would, you would make all of your art here in the center, and the programmatic things are forced to the exterior. I mean, this could be reconfigured, depending on which artist, how they wanted to use it. Uh, water closet, um, shower combined with a sink, and a wood-burning stove. Um, here's just a typical sections running through, it's, it's pretty lofty, so you could imagine big pieces of art, they, things could be clipped to the, uh, the, the bamboo framing. Um, and um, a rendering in, in the winter, you know, it's, it's cold, so these people want to conserve heat, maybe they've opened up between. And finally, um, in the evening rendering with uh, two units, kind of a little bit unbelievably glowing, but uh, still the idea that it glows from within. Um, and uh, that, that's it for that project.
Uh, so Charlottesville Green was uh, the first project actually that we did together um, out of school and the last project we did for a long time, but finally we got over it. Uh, this is a uh, project that was for a Habitat for Humanity um, proposal uh, for Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, this site is a uh, trailer park, for, back of litter, for lack of a better uh, term. It is a uh, area that is, let's say, m medium to low density, but the project was to uh, maybe triple the amount of people on the site. So moving this from a kind of low density to a highly organized, high density situation. Um, a street view uh, of the uh, site. And you can see it's a sort of unconsidered location now, but around it is very beautiful landscape. And up here on this hill is uh, Monticello. And we thought, what could make people want to live in uh, high density, um, especially where there is land? And we thought, well, we have to give them the American dream. So looking at what the American dream has become, uh, subdivision houses uh, built on speculation. Um, we started to think, what can we boil this down to? What are the sort of essences of, of these houses, of these structures? Uh, and we decided that the uh, icon of the pitch roof and the grass are the sort of main components that we should try to utilize in order to make our high density convincing. So we analyzed a typical subdivision here um, you can see uh, just a typical plan with the property lines that then gets exploded into its uh, various parcels. And we can think about, now that we see these little bits, recombining them in some way. But just recombining them wouldn't give us any higher density. We have to figure out a way to sort of embed more density in this. So whether it's through the house or the grass donut, uh, what is it? How do you do it? And we came back to this. Uh, analogy that we love, which is the, the idea of the iceberg. And the iceberg is massive below the surface. The, the actual weight of it exists uh, in a space that you don't see, and the icon of it is what you do see. That's what's above the water. Um, so if we can think about the little house units as iceberg-type configurations, um, a mass below with an icon above, um, so now stratifying the site into two kinds of densities very high density under, under layer and a sort of low density, low to medium density upper layer. So these are our eight houses that we designed. Um, and you can see that the, the top level is a, a pitched roof little house. It's a bizarrely sized house because it only contains a kitchen and a living room in most cases. Um, and the mass of the house, the bedrooms, the utilities, the garage, when there is one, is below, below the green grass. Um, that, and what we love also is the sort of differentiation of styles. So on the top, the American pitched roof, and on the bottom, this sort of very rational modernism. So taking those houses and putting them around the site, uh, you can see this is our key plan, our, 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 our cheat sheet of where they all go, and it's based on which one has a garage, what does it need to connect to a road, uh, picking out views between the houses, which ones are allowed to go next to one another, all of that. And we get a plan on the left, you're seeing the upper, upper level, so the upper public level where the grass is, where the living rooms and kitchens are, and the dense, more private level on the right below, um, bedrooms that look onto these semi-private courtyards. Um, a view of an early 3D model that's showing that relationship. Um, what's interesting is that the, the site was sloped, so there actually are sidewalks that connect to the upper public level, allowing it to, be, to feel very public. One might walk uh, upstairs, out the living room door, uh, go to the supermarket, and come back, all within that, that public realm. So standing on that level now, looking out, and seeing how landscape features start to uh, live below you as well as around you. And the look is somewhat familiar, but somewhat strange. Um, we, we think it, it's probably comforting, and it certainly doesn't feel like us to this imposing mat building. Um, 
inside views of the bridge house, a house that crosses the street, uh, houses that meet in a bridge, and another view uh, of the inside of the bridge house. And just three more renderings um, showing you the sort of differentiation within the field. So uh, not only does every moment feel different because of the rotational and locational properties of mixing the eight houses throughout, uh, but you always know what's your, which is your house because it's this unit that stands up uh, sort of above the field. And it probably looks different than the others, and if not, it in combination with the next, to it, next one to it looks different than the others, which we thought um, was very important that this be a project of placemaking. But then, of course, when you get below, down into the sort of dense level, uh, the idea of property line becomes extremely blurred as your sort of uh, view into these semi-private courtyards gets uh, sort of joined to all of the other houses around you. All right, so the, the next project is also an RFP that we answered. We, we try to answer as many RFPs as we possibly can um, in the hope that something will be realized eventually. And um, apparently this one, this one may be, um, much to our surprise, um, we were selected to, to design this project. Um, it was like a two year long project, so um, hopefully, hopefully, Hopefully you will not dislike it too much. Um, so, so here is a, um, the RFP was put up by the city of Somerville, Massachusetts. Um, and it is on Union Square, which um, the RFP called for um, the recreation of a cupola on top of a historical firehouse, which is this thing. Um, I have no idea how the, the beacon was lost. The, the cupola um, didn't say, we, we asked, nobody knew. I think it just fell down. Um, so this is a, a kind of a Google Street View of the contemporary condition um, with a little smokestack or something coming out of the top. So um, this is Union Square for those of you that are unfamiliar with it. It's a kind of pie-shaped um, pie shaped site with, uh, with a road that kind of cuts through and wake, makes other little weird squares along the way. And this is the firehouse that kind of anchors the, the corner with um, the tower and the missing cupola. And uh, Union Square's most important feature is a, is a giant parking lot here. Um, it used to be a road which went through. I, I guess at one point they blocked it off. Um, so um, we're left with this question, what exactly do we do up here? Um, we had no idea. We, we tried lots of solution flags, um, tensegrity structure, uh, structures. Um, but we kept coming back to the idea that we really just kind of liked the original cupola that was up there. and. Um, felt kind of appropriate. Um, but we knew that wasn't an actual answer to the RFP, and we, it's not a project we'd want to do. So we were thinking, how could we be inspired by this, um, this cupola? So um, I was reminded of a seminar that I had with Peter Eisenman, uh, I don't know, five, six years, maybe eight years ago. I don't even know. Um, anyway, he was really into this idea of the absence of presence and the presence of absence and uh, presence of presence and absence of absence. I, it goes on and on, but uh, <laughs> basically, um, basically our idea was to um, invert um, what was once a void and solid into um, a, a, basically a flip of it. So um, these were the windows that were once, once openings, and now we've made them solid. You can see the kind of ghost of where the columns were once, and then this is kind of left to the imagination. Um, so here you can see um, a rendered view of what we proposed. Um, we thought they would be made of polished stainless steel, um, lit from below. And I, I don't know if you can see this rendering, but they kind of taper back. Um, and you know, these are where the columns were once. And if you, squint, if you squint your eyes, you can kind of, kind of get an idea of what this kind of ghostly image of the cupola was once up there. Um, so um, we had these fanciful ideas that they would be formed out of a single sheet of stainless steel, but the budget is, is so tiny that was an impossibility. So um, our friend Nick Desbian at Caliper Studio in Brooklyn, um, work, uh, we worked with them and they uh, kind of came up with this idea to uh, basically panelize the, um, the shells into a series of facets, which you can see kind of radiating around, and those would be keyed into a series of arches, and this whole area behind would be painted a kind of sky color, so it would disappear. Um, and here, this would be the shell, still, still highly polished uh, mirror finish. So um, this is just a 
laser cut template of what the fabricator may use um, and the finished assembly here. Um, so we were, uh, we had the like formal idea of what this thing would look like, but we didn't know how exactly to light it. So um, we were speaking with our uh, lighting uh, designer and they recommended this thing, the Philips Color Blast. It's a super high LED thing, which like any building built today basically that wants exterior lighting has this. And um, you know, this is what's on the Empire State Building for all the, the light shows. Um, super efficient, like if it, one of these in each of the AHLs could, could run every evening and it would cost like $80 at the end of the year. So, so it's like totally, totally amazing. Um, the thing that we didn't uh, quite anticipate was that it could make every color of the rainbow. We kind of wanted this thing to be this kind of ghostly pale thing that would just kind of be looming up in the sky. But um, we knew once the city heard that we could, we could give them any color they wanted, they, they would want a, like a technicolor uh, fantasy up there. So we were thinking, how could we kind of rein this in and give it some order? So we came up with this uh, branding solution for Union Square, which is actually, I think, I think this is what sold the mayor on the project because it was like bumper stickers could be made out of this and t-shirts <laughs> and uh, all sorts of things like that. So um, we took this one step further and um, I, I mentioned the, the large parking lot. I, I sold them a bit short. It's actually, um, well, 90% of the time it's a parking lot, but the other 10%, it's, a, it's like an event space where they have like green markets and things like that. So our idea was how could the, the, you know, this thing truly function like a beacon for the events which are happening below and um, to kind of utilize that color. So um, we came up with this idea, events at Union Square where the beacon would symbolize what's, what's happening, happening below. So if you have a pumpkin patch, it's, it's orange. Um, so um, here's a kind of a day in the life, um, some excerpts from our um, animation. Um, during the day, it reflects the city kind of stuff happening below. And then at night, the, it glows from within. So that's, that's it. Um. The Four Delightful Gardens is a project we developed uh, specifically for a show at Exit Art Gallery called Vertical Gardens. And um, to begin, we started thinking about, okay, well, what makes vertical gardens possible? And uh, for the most part, the idea is hydroponics. So uh, we started looking at different types of hydroponics. Here you see um, stacked bucket hydroponics. Um, there's also more high-tech high solutions where there's this giant wheel with uh, troughs that uh, rotates around the light source. Um, and then you have these trough-based systems uh, where the nutrients run underneath or behind a tilted wall. But the thing we like best is the sort of DIY um, reuse system. So this uh, tube-based hydroponic system here made out of uh, PVC pipes that have been, let's say, reused, um, and soda bottles that feed the nutrients down through the, the matrix. And we like this because not only was it simple, but it was three-dimensional. There's plants growing out of all sides of it, and uh, we can imagine reconfiguring this into something that does become vertical. So here, a sort of horizontal configuration, and we thought, well, how do we make this a vertical garden? And we remembered our friend Buckminster Fuller. And uh, this uh, image here, I apologize for the graininess, uh, shows him showing a uh, tensegrity structure. Of course, we thought, well, why not combine the two? Uh, Tube-based hydroponics as the rigid or uh, as the rigid members of the tensegrity system. So not uh, plants grown under tensegrity, but plants growing tensegrity. And we looked at uh, Kenneth Nelson, the, the inventor, uh, as I understand it, of Tensegrity and, and his, his sculptures, um, and started to realize that these things, the systems can do so many different things. It can take so many different forms. Here's a detail of that, of that same sculpture. Um, and so we decided, well, let's start with the three, the three basic forms, the, the plane on the left, the uh, sphere on the bottom, and the column on the right. But we thought, okay, if we're going to make uh, this, this system, it has to be very specific where it gets installed. So there has to be a relationship between uh, the type that we're using and the way it's used. So the first application that we looked at was a missing tooth block. So a row house block where a house is missing. You could imagine uh, 
using the plain type uh, of tensegrity structure to skin that missing, uh, that missing house. And because it can be adjusted um, in any way, you can start to pick up the datums of the houses around. So a rendering of what that might look like to sort of reinstate the continuity of the block. Uh, a more fanciful and fun uh, installation here are these spheres, uh, giant spheres hanging underneath a disused um, elevated railroad, um, turning you know, a sort of dismal space into something that's uh, fun and lively and probably cleaning the air. Um, and then lastly, we thought, okay, well, we can also start to incorporate other things into this system. So what if we incorporated light? Um, and the final image here is the column-based the column uh, system where uh, we're now saying is installed uh, between the tracks of a disused uh, rail yard. And we thought it could be trees, columns in this case, when they open up at the top, become trees in a way. What's strange is that because all parts of the tree are growing the same plant, the trunk becomes green too. Um, but it's a sort of, uh, in this case, we imagine maybe uh, an aviary sanctuary. Okay. Um, okay, this is the last project I'll talk about. Um, this is another RFP that we, we did of Peaks and Valleys, we called it. Um, this was put out by the um, city of Phoenix, Arizona, and they wanted shade structures. And that's basically all they said. They didn't tell us where they would go. They didn't say how many they wanted. Um, we were kind of designing in a vacuum for this one. So we were totally reaching on what, what, what to do. And we had recently gone for a hike in a mountain, not, not this mountain, this is pretty amazing. Um, we're not that good. But um, we were hiking on a, on a hot day, um, and we happened to be caught in the shadow of a mountain. And um, it was really cold. And um, you can see here, this is like, has snow in the, in the, in the, uh, the shadow, but obviously the sunny side is, looks temperate. Um, so we were thinking about mountains, and that would be pretty amazing to pr pr have this mountainous thing that provides shade, shade to you. Um, so this is the Sonoran Desert, which is just north of Phoenix. And of course, the reciprocal of the mountain is the valley. So um, if you can see, the, the mountain here is actually a pretty barren thing. Nothing really grows on it that well. But these valleys, um, water collects. Things, things grow quite well in the valley. So um, we had this idea of mountains and valleys. That was what we went forward with. We weren't exactly sure how to formalize it. And um, this is um, the nine square grid problem, which was a John Hadeck problem that I never actually did, but was always a little curious on what it would be like to do. So um, we thought this would be a decent place to start. So um, I think we misinterpreted the nine square grid slightly. Um, the, the idea here was uh, that the intersections were a series of columns, but we thought about them as a series of points, um, which we then um, pulled in the vertical dimension um, to create a tiny little mini mountain down here, um, in which case you could walk underneath the surface. And then um, finally, we resolved the surface um, through triangulation. Um, so we made four of these little mountains, and um, each have a different kind of characteristic. Um, some of them have lots of peaks, some of them have a ridge, some are quite flat. But what they all share in common are certain datums, which when they bump into their neighbor, there will be some continuity be between the surface. And um, so if we have mountains here, um, this is like, a, I guess, a quarter of a valley here, which when partnered up with his friend down here could make a larger valley. So um, because we were designing a bit in a vacuum where these things would go, we we try to um, envision usages for these things, so um, you know, sc a, sc a scattered field of these things, um, a larger path network, perhaps, or um, a kind of a, a larger agglomeration of market space or path down here. Um, so here's a kind of aerial view of what that looks like with um, four basic units that um, gives you a pretty varied topography based on the relationships to one another and uh, through like tricks of rotation only. Um, and uh, we came up with this idea to slat them in wood, wood boards and to, to vary the spacing of the boards based on local specificity. So if you wanted it more shadowy or less shadowy, you could play with the orientation of the boards. 
Um, so here's, here's a view within. Um, you can see the shadow pattern is a pretty dynamic thing. Um, during the course of the day, it's going to change and um, from week to week and certainly year to year. Um, and here is our idea for the valley. So um, you've got the sun shining up here um, and the shadow from the mountain. And you can plant um, things that don't ordinarily grow very well in Arizona. So you could have um, flowers or manicured lawn, um, a reflecting pool perhaps. And then um, things not in the shadow of the mountain, you can plant with uh, native Phoenix air, uh, xeriscaping. So um, here's a plan, which is a bit hard to understand, but it's, it's cut kind of like right in the middle, right through some of the valleys. So you can see uh, these valleys at the perimeter planted with a, a desert, desert plant life. And then in the ones in the shadow of the mountain get you know, lawns and, and greenery with uh, pools. And then uh, finally a detail section through that with openings and some of them have passages into these valleys. Um, and uh, just a quick walk through with uh, some looking into some of the valleys. Um, larger valley, you can make these things quite large through the uh, configurations. Um, and then I guess the last kind of thing is, you know, as the, as the sun begins to set, the, sh the shadows begin to recede and the, and the light penetrates more. Uh, it doesn't need to keep you quite as cool as it once did. And uh, finally, um, instead of looking down, now you're looking up at a field of uh, lights, which kind of echo the canopy uh, system above. So that's, that's it. Okay, and our, our, our last project that we'll speak about tonight uh, is a house for a retired couple in Irish Hills, Michigan. Um, Irish Hills uh, is somewhat rural. You can see uh, to the east here of our site um, active farmland, um, but also to the south um, vacation homes uh, surrounding some inland lakes. Um, this project uh, started with a request from, from one member of the couple for a barn and the other one uh, wanted a house. So, of course, uh, barns, barns are not houses, but we can try to think about the intersection between. Um, the site uh, is gently sloping. So here in the wild, wildflowers looking up at the tree line. Um, and then to the east of the site, the lower end, uh, we get the pond. So we started looking at uh, some, some of the barns that surround this uh, piece of property. And this is a very typical barn that you see in this, this area of Michigan. Um, so the red vertical boards with white uh, corner boards. And what's great is that uh, so many of them have this earthen ramp you can see here leading up to uh, most often the hayloft. Uh, here's a, a more extreme example of the earthen ramp. And sometimes you even get um, rooms beneath them. And we thought this was really interesting, but also we're taking on some, we were taking on some of the detailing that was very typical uh, of the area and these kind of barn structures. So the, the stone base um, that just gets simply lapped by the boards above, and the idea of how the vertical boards are installed, um, often not weather sealed um, and separated to allow uh, wind and sort of ventilation through the structure in these barns but of course uh, also a great light effect. So here's a heavy timber uh, gambrel uh, frame and this is the kind of uh, very simple frame that's been used for these kind of barns for, for forever. Uh, they're made on the ground and then tilted up into place. And we started thinking about, okay, well, you know, what can we, what can we do with this? How can we start to think about a, a barn as a house um, and uh, of course, start to incorporate things like windows. Um, so here uh, is a axonometric of repetitive sections of that same frame where we begin to change it slightly. Um, what's interesting is you are creating no more of a complex form. Nothing, it's no more difficult to build than the original um, gambrel heavy timber frame. Uh, still tilt up framing, but uh, now you can start to have a more complex uh, surface. And so in incorporating a foreign element, like a large window, we thought uh, we could pull this part of the barn out of plane. 
Um, and you can see here uh, this sort of uh, geometry below, which actually uh, holds a staircase that connects these two levels. So this is now in plan. You can see the, the one bay at the top here that's been pulled out of plane. And we're showing a very open plan right now. This, this project is st still in progress, so we hope, we hope the open plan stays. Um, but a uh, big living room, dining room, and a kind of mass core with the kitchen, uh, and a little staircase up to uh, a loft above. Going down now into the stony base, uh, much like our Charlottesville project, we have the private bedrooms below, um, and they look out into this uh, courtyard that's defined by an earthen ramp uh, on the right and a retaining wall on the left, um, now mitigating the slope on the site. So you can see here uh, building elevations. Um, thinking about the building as a tube, we decided that the ends could also have windows, so uh, big windows at, at one end and uh, at the other as well. But the other way we were incorporating light is to start to separate the uh, boards. So um, here above an open air porch that's at the end of the earthen ramp, you can see the boards start to separate. Um, but they also do uh, in sort of interior spaces. So we think about this, uh, these boards as a kind of rain screen where you can start to separate them for, let's say, a skylight over a dining room uh, or over a kind of master suite. And here's a very early rendering of what that might start to look like here, looking at the open, uh, open air porch and the boards starting to separate, and then a view from, from within that porch as well. And uh, a final rendering of uh, that, that big window and what it might feel like to start to frame the landscape in a way that almost seems uh, yearning. So thank you very much.